I want to point out that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Energy Week with George Harvey, me, and Tom Fennell, who you already know because he sta sits there staring into the camera like a deer in the headlights because <laughs> <laughs> he's doing our engineering while he's, while he's d doing everything else. He's really quite a marvel. Um, we have Jeff with us. Jeff, what is your last name? Dickinson. D Jeff, Jeff Dickinson with us, who is expert on a remarkable wide variety of renewable energy approaches, and James Perkins, who Jeff works with and who runs a company called Little Green Hydro. Wave to the camera. Guys. Wave to the camera, <laughs> Jeff and James. <laughs> We're very friendly here. Um, <coughs> I get up every morning at about 4 o'clock and start looking at head headlines, and I, I find the best I can and post them at my website, which is geoharvey.wordpress.com. You've had enough coffee by now. Yes. And um, I also write for Green Energy Times. Um, but the point is that I, I wind up having a lot of headlines, and that's what this show is about. We're sharing them. So I'm going to start on last Friday, which is the 11th of April. And I'm just going to go through these, and our guests are allowed to comment whenever they feel like it. The first item is from building.co.uk. The future of small-scale renewable power projects has been thrown into doubt by changes to European state aid rules, industry le leaders have claimed. The European Commission changed its guidance on state aid for renewable energy. And I am not sure what all that means because it's very complicated. The next item is Lord Nicholas Stern, author of a landmark 2006 study on climate change, says the conclusion that global output could dive 5% to 20% without action to curb greenhouse gases was an understatement. That from the Sydney Morning Herald. <coughs> and um, the third item for that day, last Friday, the UK has, has successfully lobbied, we're getting back to the EU state guidelines, to have an article containing the phrase, quote, the measure sh should in principle not reward investments in generation from fossil fuels end quote, removed from the new EU state guidelines. They're allowing the countries to, to subsidize fossil fuels. I was reading that, and I, I didn't think I understood it the way you just said. Oh, really? <laughs> but, well, maybe, maybe people should actually go to the source. <laughs> it did not seem to be sensible. No, I, it doesn't seem to be sensible at all. But then again, why shouldn't we... For, subsidize fossil fuels. Why? After all, these billionaires need more money. Oh, well, you know. <laughs> that was, by the way, from the Solar Power Portal, and that's in the um, April 11th edition. You know, now, I'm, I'm going to just interject a second here. I got a lot of stuff set up to pull up on the screen. I'm not going to bother doing it, because if I do, we're going to take away from what these guys well, have Well, you know, we, we've, we've got next week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we can we do can, that. A lot yeah. of this stuff just hangs this, in there. Because this looks pretty interesting. Week week. I, this looks yeah. interesting. Okay, now this is the item that I think is one of the two most interesting of the week. And it's, it's very discreet. It's, not, it's very simple. Eminent Bishop and Nobel Prize winner Desmond Tutu. Remember him? Huh? I yeah, have a absolutely. Of him. I lost it. Has called <laughs> on businesses to cut ties with fossil fuels industry in the same way they did with South African companies during apartheid. This is a moral voice speaking. That's also a practical way of doing it. Money <laughs> talks. <laughs> well, not only that, but they can save money doing it. Yeah. <laughs> oh dear. Okay. No, neither of you guys well, has anything to say. I mean, I think it, it, it's, a, it's a good point. I mean, uh, for, for Desmond Tutu to come out and say that and others, there were 10, 15 years ago a, a real push in, uh, in Thailand of, among certain groups of, of Buddhist monks to um, 
essentially force their not, force their their practitioners to conserve certain force and sort of bringing up the whole idea of force conservation. So having religious leaders go at it from a religious aspect yes. it puts additional moral force that people can't, if they follow that religion, can't really ignore. So I think it's it's a, it's a very clever way to sort of start pushing from a different angle that really hasn't been approached yet yes. um, by any of the church leaders. Okay. Um. The next item, oh, that, by the way, was from Blue and Green Tomorrow. The next item from Green Tech Media, we are halfway to market dominance for solar. Believe it or not, electricity output from solar PVs is approaching 1% of the total global electric production, according to the IEA. That may not seem like much, but that 1% is actually halfway to go to the goal of market dominance. Well, I had a hard time reading this one. It took me a long time to figure it out. I was counting two, four, six, eight. <laughs> and this guy is talking about everything doubling. So it's not two, four, six, eight. It's two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four. Yeah. yeah. That's what's hap That's why we're halfway there with one percent. Yes, that's right. Yeah. It, it, well, it doesn't make sense, but, it, <laughs> but yeah, it, looking at the this, math works. Yeah, yeah, looking at it a different way. If you if if you if you want to if you want to stop dealing with just solar and deal with all renewable energy of of new types other than hydro dams, um, basically what happens is solar power is growing so fast that it's almost half solar and and other renewables are growing so fast that right now they're already they may dominate this year because they In may be worldwide they worldwide they may be 50 percent of the of yeah. the installations yeah. this year if you combine all renewable resources yeah. going in uh, you know other than the other than the old hydro dams and that being the case it's easy to believe that solar power is um, is a big deal even at one percent right. approaching one percent I, I mean that, that that may be the case but I think that's that's sort of frighteningly misleading uh, in a way to say that that one percent of, of generation worldwide is is going to you know shift the particular market or, or or halfway to 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 sort of gaining something like that. I mean, in terms of solar's pract you know practicality and such, there's an awful lot of natural limitations on it, technological limitations that just will will prevent it from growing in, beyond a certain level. Um, and I think that to sort of there's an awful lot of flag waving, waving and cheerleading going on right now about solar worldwide. And it is growing very fast because it's amazingly easy to put up and really fast to put That's up. That's right. And I think, and I've seen this in, in different places, that politicians latch onto that because it's shiny, it's new, it's modern, and it goes in so fast. Um, so that's why we're, we're seeing it grow. And I, I actually came to the conclusion fairly recently, reading all this and seeing that we're, we're, we're in a bubble. We're in a solar PV bubble. Well, we might be. It um, might be. So, but if, if we but are, we then, then there's the, one of the things that, you, you know, I think that people who are in the, in the renewables uh, field have to realize, uh, most of them actually do, uh, but people who are, who are kind of at the periphery of that field, looking in, politicians mm -hmm. and people who care in the, they, they really have to understand that what we're talking about is an energy mix. Yes. And yeah. we have to approach, approach that energy mix as a mix because if we depend on one thing, it's not going to work. Yeah, we've seen where we end up with that with oil and, and you yeah, know, taking absolutely. over such a degree. Yeah. Sure. Um, the next item is um, uh, same day from the Japan Times. A radical shift from fossil fuels to low carbon energy would slow world economic growth by only a tiny fraction every year. A new draft U UN report on tackling global warming has said that was issued on Friday. The report was actually issued on Sunday uh, and, and made available to the public on Monday. And um, we will get into that more. Um, that, those, that was on, um, on Saturday. On Sunday was when the IPCC report was released. This is the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I'm glad I was right. able to remember I'm, that. I'm seeing this all over the net. All over it the is place. Popping it's up not everywhere. going to go away. Yeah. Yeah. Not going to go away. <laughs> and I, I find it interesting that Desmond Tutu's announcement was before that was released. He knew it well, was coming. Well, it was leaked a lot. Though. Yeah, it was leaked a lot. <laughs> but I, I, just, I just think this is, you know, we're seeing a confluence of events here. The IPCC report 
says greenhouse gases need to be cut by 70 percent before 2050 to control climate change and the job will become harder and more expensive unless the transformation is made within 15 years. That from the Daily Mail. Now the next one, also on the IPCC report, says catastrophic climate change can be averted without sacrificing living standards and concludes that the transformation to a world of clean energy ditching dirty fossil fuels is eminently affordable. This from an organization called Business Green. And that, I think, is really the crux of the issue. We have to do it, but really we're going to, ultimately, I think it's not going to be a matter of having to cut back anything. I think everything is going to be improved, except for the, the income of people who are dependent on the fossil fuel mm -hmm. industry. Mm -hmm. And it kind of reminds me of my ex-wife, who said there was one thing in this world she hated more than everything else. Everything. And that was being told that she had to do something that she was planning on doing anyway. <laughs> and in this case, it's a little easier than that, because we're being told that we have to do something that is going to save us money. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of good examples from industries doing that from around the world. Oh, many. You know, just, and that's sort of the approach, and I think a lot of that's missed. You know, if you go to like the cassava, the starch industry in Thailand, it's now all running self-contained. It's actually exporting clean power to the grid and saving phenomenal amount of money inside the, inside the business. Is, that is cool, cassava. And, now, yeah. what is it that they're doing? The cassava is a root that yeah. they extract the starch from, and right. the starch is tapioca. Yes. Okay. So okay. Eat, and, and tapioca, guys. eat tapioca from <laughs> Thailand, um, and, and Tha Thailand is the largest exporter of tapioca of cassava starch in the world. It's a okay. huge industry, hundreds okay. of mills. These mills now have all virtually gone over to using their wastewater to make biogas to run their operations. And because the government in Thailand allowed net metering up to 10 megawatts, oh, they're wow. now Ooh. yeah they're very progressive Ooh. and successful. They're now exporting large amounts of power back into the grid. So they've seen their, their waste become an energy source well, the, and their prices drop. But this is, this is so yeah. something that you see so much mm -hmm. in, renewable, in the renewable world is that the waste is a valuable yep. resource. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I, I, I find kind of mm -hmm. thrilling. One of the most interesting books <coughs> I've ever read was a book called Garbage. And it was about the history of waste in the United States. And it harkens back to, you know, my childhood when we were told by people who believed it that if we waste, if we bought things that were consumer products that would just be thrown away, it would be good. Hmm. It would be mm -hmm. good for, the, for, the, for, for everybody because it would mean higher employment. And don't worry about the fact that, you know, a hundred years from now, if we do this yeah. till then, we're going to have six I, I feet of waste. Hear that. I heard waste not what not. <laughs> yeah. that, that was you also there. <laughs> that was also there. But during the 1930s, people yeah. said, well, you know, if we have Maybe. disposable right. diapers, we're going to, it means right. that, you know, we'll employ more people. Yeah, we need to use less. We need yeah. to use less. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, a, it's all about sustainability. But the world has changed. Mm -hmm. Next item, this is also on the 13th, Geo geologists in Ohio for the first time linked earthquakes to a geological formation deep under the Appalachians um, in, in those formations to hydraulic fracturing, leading the state to issue new permit conditions on Friday in certain areas that are among the state, state's um, strictest, and that from the Huffington Post. Now, this is an item which I find very interesting. More than 7,000 megawatts of new wind turbines are be scheduled to be built by the end of, this, of next year, potentially increasing Texas wind power capacity by 60%. Let's say that number again, just so it's 7,000 megawatts. Now, I figure that if That's you... That's about 10 Yankees or something like that? Well, no, because the capacity factor... Capacity is factor, yeah. But the... But the, the, the um, the capacity factor of wind in Texas is approaching 50 percent. Okay. And in some in some isolated turbines, it's actually getting over 50 percent. So this 7,000 megawatts, we could call that a 3,000 megawatts of continuous supply, and that would be that would be three modern nuclear reactors of kind of intermediate size. 
-hmm. And that's just going that's up over, between now and the end of next and, year. And I did read that article, and that 7,000 is more than any other. This is what they're adding yes, in one year. Just in, <laughs> and that's yeah. more than any other state presently has. That's right. Just Texas. Yeah, and it's so, so this is growing very yeah. rapidly. Yes. The amount being installed is greater than any other state has in place. Now, that's Dallas Morning News. One thing that I should point out, by the way, is um, the technology to transport that power is, is, exists. And in fact, in Texas, yeah. No, no, no. Just the technology exists. Oh, least, sure. Yeah, you know. yeah. There's a company in Air, Massachusetts. Um, Aya. 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 That's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they will they will put up. Uh, uh, you know, they have a they have a, a transmission system which is already being. Uh, their patents are already being infringed on in in China. Mm -hmm. Um, no yes. <laughs> but their their uh, their uh, line loss is down around, uh, uh, it's down below three hmm. percent per wow. thousand miles. So um, you know, in 1986, the line loss was something like nine and a half percent, and that and that was, and the and the DOE said that was enough that you could transmit high voltage DC for four thousand miles, high voltage AC for for twenty five hundred, and be cost effective. I now, when you get seven percent, so when you, we're, in a, the, we're in that area. Yeah, and and that's that's the standard of new stuff, seven percent mm -hmm. as of about nineteen ninety five. Mm -hmm. But at two and a half percent it means that you could generate power anywhere in the Western Hemisphere. And if you've just got the cable, which is not going to be cheap, mm. you could deliver it anywhere in the Western Hemisphere. Mm. Yep. So that power in Texas has, has, an, has implications for the New England grid. There's power being generated in, in uh, Kansas, wind power, that's being delivered to Alabama. There's power that's going to be generated in Wyoming, as you know, that's being d delivered, delivered to, to California. San Diego, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. all the way yeah. down to Southern Almost California. Almost Mexico. Mm. Yeah. So that's that's a big deal, and um, and the fact that it can just go up over a period of months is impressive. Okay, on the 14th, negotiations between London and Dublin over cross-border trading of onshore wind power have failed, according to the Irish Energy Minister, whose name is Rabbit. 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 <laughs> Rabbit does not sound Irish. <laughs> The breakdown leaves a gigawatt scale ambitions of various organizations unlikely to progress before 2020, if at all. That from Re News. And next, the United States DOE's National Renewable Energy Laboratory has warned that failing to renew the production tax credit could cause the growth of the wind sector to fall from 8.7 gigawatts per year in 2008 to 2012 to between three and five gigawatts next year. I, does, is Texas part of this country anymore? <laughs> well, they, they do have their own grid. They have their own, actually, I think they've got it's, more than one. Well, well whatever it is, yeah. it's, it's isolated. Yeah. It's, it's its own. It is its own. Yes, that's right. Okay. Now, on the 15th, which is the day before yesterday, the Czech run state uh, uh, state-run power utility says it has canceled a tender to build two more nuclear reactors because of falling electrical prices have made the multi-billion dollar project less feasible Westinghouse and a Russian consortium were bidding to build the reactors I wonder if that was influenced by the invasion of Crimea um, but it's important to note that that was because they, the reason was that they stayed. It's economics. It's economics. That's, and it was, that's what's going to drive this revolution. Yeah. After that, and this is an interesting, this is a really a kind of, it's a very interesting thing. It's one of those things that you, if you focus on certain, certain things that you hit in the news that don't make sense, sometimes you can learn something from them. About 75% of New Zealand's electricity comes from renewable resources. And the government has pledged to raise that to 90% by 2025. But a senior executive, executive from Citigroup, who was visiting um, New Zealand and giving a talk to uh, a conference in Wellington, told the audience the percentage could be greater. Radio New Zealand. That's interesting. <laughs> That's interesting. Citigroup is yeah. saying that isn't <laughs> That's quite as well as you can do. <laughs> 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 
Ninety percent. And here it gets. It's, it's money talking. It's money talking. Absolutely. Okay. On the sixteenth, yesterday, the first qu uh, quarter clean energy investment rose nine percent from last year on surging demand for rooftop solar panels. New investment in renewable power and energy efficiency rose to forty-seven point seven billion, up from forty-three point six billion, according to Bloomberg New Energy Finance, and that from Bloomberg. Um, uh, former Prime Ministers uh, Koizumi and um, Hosokawa will establish an anti-nuclear power forum in May to promote research into renewable energy and support anti-nuclear candidates in elections. And that was now, that's quite a from the Japan Times. Well, yeah. these people have been very strongly anti-nuclear. Ever since Fukushima. Ever since Fukushima. Mm, yep. And they're, you know, th it had happens that the Prime Minister of Japan whose name is Abe, <coughs> um, is pro-nuclear because he thinks it'll be good for business. And um, so on the this short is a term, counter to, to yeah, that. Yeah, but it's interesting because Abe has support that has nothing to do with nuclear. And the, the average Japanese, in fact, I've forgotten what the last, what the last uh, polls said, but it seems to me that it was something like 80% of the Japanese were anti-nuclear. So I don't, you know, these... That, that fits with what I'm reading. Yeah. I think it's yeah. I think that's that's close to it. Okay. Now here's another one, and I think this is something to note. ISO New England, which of course is supplying power in New England, reports today that the volatile natural gas market in this region pushed wholesale electric prices up by 55 percent last year. We're already seeing some of this in the retail level, but the real impact will likely be seen in our monthly bills next winter. That from the Boston Business Journal, that does not mean that it will have that much effect in Vermont where we get much of our power from Hydro-Quebec. But there's but, not enough pipelines for the gas in Massachusetts. Yeah. And that's yeah. what's causing it. Yeah. It's not and that there isn't are, any gas, it's that they can't get it where they need it. Yeah, and people, people, are, people are having... It's a problem because they need to add infrastructure to take care of the gas that they think is going to be coming from the fields, which may not deliver. <laughs> going to run out by the time they get the infrastructure built. <laughs> what can you say? I mean, that, that, that sort of points out the whole lack of infrastructure and energy delivery in this country in the last however many years. You know, the grid's falling apart in places, the electrical grid, there's not yeah. enough gas pipelines. That's it's right. been like a real yeah. sort of avoidance of putting in that infrastructure. But I'll tell you something, we got a lot of free infrastructure. It's called streams and rivers. Oh yeah, no, exactly, exactly. You know, and the wind blows and the sun shines. Um, that's and the trees right. grow too. But yes, it, it just it right. sort of shows that, you know, there's been no push and no government um, support for industry to get into well, transmission because there's not much money in transmission. You know, there's more. There, I, I think there will be though. I think yeah. that's where the money is going to it be It has made. to go now. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it has to go now. I think that's it was right. in this article that I read and it hasn't been decided yet, but what it looked like to me is they're going to put a surcharge on the electrical customers so that they can build more gas pipelines. Hmm. Okay. That doesn't make sense to me. There's but, a lot of things in this world that don't answer, make sense. But the answer going on to that is, is it really doesn't matter because the users are going to pay for it, whether they're the gas users or the electrical users. <laughs> oh, boy. Are they going to put a surcharge on natural gas to support electric? I didn't read that in the article. Yeah, I didn't think yeah. so. Okay. Now, here's another one, which I think is really interesting. California's recent revisions to Title 24 put in place ambitious performance goals. All new residential buildings must be net zero energy by oh, 2020. Oh, yeah. Explain net Whoa. zero. Explain net well, zero. Well, net zero means that the amount of energy you use is not greater than the amount of energy you produce. OK. Or to put another way, you make more energy than you use. And there are. Buildings of that type already around. I, I, had a, I saw an article about one in, uh, saw an article? Maybe I wrote the article. <laughs> I think I wrote it. Uh, a house in, in Devons, Massachusetts, where um, they get money from the grid, and it, it is more than they pay for the propane they use when they use propane. Mm -hmm. And the reason is because they've got a house that's very well insulated, that is powered by solar panels. But this is not only covering multi 
and single family dwellings, it, the next step is going to cover yeah. industrial. Yes, Office the commercial buildings, and buildings and have to meet the same standard by 2030. They do allow them to count storage. They allow them to count storage. So okay. if they get batteries, that's, that's part, part of, of their, the, yeah, uh, well, the mix, which yeah, makes sense. It makes sense. This is likely to have ripple effects through the whole nation's construction industry. And yes, it will have ripple effects. And there are more and more people who are saying that they want their houses to be net zero. And it's, it is, the, the fact is that there are, there are solutions to this that there's the passive house solution. And the passive house solution is mind boggling, but I can tell you that I know for a fact that it works. Um, in a passive house, the the house is sufficiently well insulated and you have to have air circulation is a big deal. You've got to make sure that you've got air coming in from inside to, to the inside from outside and going out <clears throat> because otherwise you're going to have bad air inside. But in a passive house, the house is sufficiently well designed and insulated and, and, and um, so forth that um, the ordinary activity of human life, and if you have a big dog, the dog's life, um, is sufficient to power the heat for the house. The 100-watt dog. The 100-watt yeah, yeah, dog. The you know, you person. were talking about economics before, yeah. and for this particular topic, I'll just say, you know, microhydro is really the only renewable technology available to the citizen today that can achieve that economically, a net zero house. Solar can't do it cost effectively, nor can wind, not without subsidies and incentives. But microhydro, because it's baseline power and cost effective, can actually do a net zero house. So, you know, that's something we would be generating power back, selling power to the grid if we could, like solar, putting solar panels on rooftops connected to the network. Can, can the we cannot do that. You can't do that. Uh, not because we can't technologically. Regulatory. Oh, yeah, yeah, regulatory. Yeah, regulatory. Because regulatory. it's required in Vermont to get a CPG, a Certificate of Public Good, because the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, the feds, <laughs> say, you know what, solar and wind is okay, but this thing has this word, hydro. Therefore, you can't send these renewable electrons to the grid without us telling you you can do it and you need a license and a permit <laughs> yeah, or else you do money. what we do, it costs $50,000, yeah, yeah. uh, which is way more than a microhydro system. And as a result, sadly, we end up burning off renewable electrons from microhydro, just like they used to do with the gas wells burning, oil wells they burning off the yeah. gas. Now, the no. microhydro power that goes untapped is just power that's going untapped. Correct. It's just water going down a stream. And folks, stick around because you're gonna hear about this <laughs> and and we're gonna go into that. But this is the this is the government at work. <laughs> or not. Yeah, it, it's even worse than that, though, George. It's, there's water energy going downstream, but in our case, we actually have a microhydro system that has fully met the demand of the house and has renewable electrons that could be shared with others on the grid. And because of regulatory, we have to just burn those. Now, let me ask you a question, just as you're saying this, because I know I'm not going to remember this. Okay. Could a deal be worked out with Green Mountain Power, for example, if it were in Vermont and in the Green Mountain Power system? Would it be possible for the household owner to say, I want to hook this to the grid, and by the way, Green Mountain Power, can we sell this to you? Mm. Would that be uh, something that would be... It's possible. It's unlikely that would happen. With a small business, it's more likely. Too small. Or a municipality. Yeah. A small okay. business um, is more likely to do that. Okay. An individual house, probably not, but there's no reason it shouldn't be permitted. Yeah, because if we can do it with solar panels and wind panels, the power that's generated from the microhydro system is actually pure sign, and it's better than the grid yeah, power today yeah. cycle-wise. Yeah. And, and, okay. and again, just to sort of close up on that, the, the, the utility will face, the Green Mountain or whoever, will face that same regulatory issue of where did that power come from. And so if it came oh. from hydro, they've got to prove that, you know, there's a, there's, it's, it's, it's properly permitted. Okay, so which it, means that Green Mountain power may not, not even be able to say yes, I'll do, uh, even though it's not, do, yeah, and unfortunately, they can't go wink, wink. We'll take it. They've yeah. got to have it's economics, it, really, yeah. and that's where it puts it out of the reach of the average citizen. Which our technology is 
exactly for the citizen, not yeah. for big industrial cost of permitting wind farms right. or solar farms. Right. Okay. Now today's news. We've got four more items, and then we're going to get into show and tell on micro hydro. Um, and this is from the Energy Collective. When the wind blows and the sun shines in Germany, uh, electric prices in the country plummet. Natural gas peaker plants are not needed as peaks have been erased and they cannot compete with new renewables. But the grid still needs balancing resources like demand response. Now, it's interesting that GE got involved in exactly that situation. Just just recently, I think it might have been today. <laughs> it's not a coincidence. <laughs> in Scotland, though, yeah. in Scotland, GE is 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 uh, built is is going into supplying wind farms with capacitors that can store electricity. This I think we're going to see things continually changing. There's going to be many many changes, yeah. and they're all going to be for the better. Next, the uh, this from scoop.co.nz. The IPCC report is positive on renewables' ability to s deal with carbon emissions. It addresses nuclear power as possible solution, but also underscores considerable barriers for it. The combination illustrates the conclusion that nuclear is largely irrelevant. <laughs> okay, <laughs> nuclear power is irrelevant. Okay, and we will get to that in just a moment because <laughs> there's an issue. There's something here that you don't know about. Came in just this morning. No. The IPCC report doesn't call for a fracking boom. That is the, hmm. that's the headline of, a, of an opinion piece that appeared in Grist today. Interpretations of the report say it endorses fracking, urging a dash for gas as a bridge to fuel to put us on a path to more renewable energy <clears throat> are exaggerated, lacking in content, or just plain wrong. And the final thing, and I have to thank Bill Pearson for this because he sent me this in an email. I missed it. Over the past few months, there has been a, a bit of a sell-off of energy stock. Oh, <laughs> that's interesting. But the sell-off is not from just anybody. Aha. Uh -huh. The sales the are being <coughs> done by corporate executives. Five of them hmm. have sold large quantities in, in the period of December through April. And why? Well, I was going to ask that. This is this is from a from an organization. You know, I forgot to write their name down. I think it's called Green Power, um, which has just started up in the last few months, and they are they're giving the reasons why nuclear power is probably not the best approach. And gentlemen, we are ready to talk about microhydro again. Okay. Great. Okay. We've got 28 minutes before the end of the hour, so you've got. Well, Start just, talking, guys. Yeah, just yeah. <laughs> start off with um, briefly, then I'll let Jeff do uh, most of the detail. We'll, we'll both cover things. Um, we're, we're a couple of the guys with Little Green Hydro, and we've been out in the uh, field and the market and citizens groups. In fact, um, I put a plug in for next, is next week, next Wednesday the 30th, or is it two weeks? Week after. Week after. Um, town energy committees uh, in this isn't, uh, I guess Brattleboro is considered Upper Valley, isn't it? Sort no, of, not well, I really. don't know. Not I, really. Where does the demarcation I don't take know. Like Springfield. Springfield, yeah. 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 Well, there's know. a Upper Valley Energy Roundtable taking place on April 30th in the White River Junction uh, Bisbee Senior Center at 5.30 to 9.30. And town energy committees, folks from town energy committees, are coming and actually will be there with an exhibit along with other renewable energy providers and others, and that's done by the Sustainable Energy Research Group. So mark your calendar. Uh, if you're a town anywhere, well, any town, anyone can come. Um, so um, that, that will be something that will have um, actually some more of our components of our eco-hydro system there to demonstrate. And I wanted to get back to what you had asked um, us to look at, George, okay. a number of weeks ago, which was, where and how in Brattleboro could we produce sustainable, low-cost energy with microhydro? How could we do something that would be visible and economical and, you know, really 
important to yes. show how this could work. And I'm happy to say that uh, we have actually had uh, conversations with, we have identified within, I believe, the city limits such as, I mean, there's mm -hmm. actually city limits, right? Town limits. Town, yeah. Well, yeah. bigger Brown than the town. I mean, there must be village limits then, right? Of the well, the town, the town goes out to uh, past the center of West Brattleboro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so I know that. Um, I'm talking about right here in sort of um, urban <laughs> Brattleboro, urban downtown, 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 downtown Brattleboro. Downtown. The areas where people are not allowed to walk around nude. Right, right. right. <laughs> okay. Well, well yeah. defined. <laughs> Well, anyway, we, we found a wonderful microhydro site uh, that potentially could produce um, lots of clean, low-cost power for a small business in Brattleboro. We may actually be speaking with them today. Oh, good. And it's the type of thing that this could be paying this business back hundreds of dollars a month from day one. Mm -hmm. and actually contributing to building a local renewable energy uh, product. So we're very excited about that, and thanks to, to you for suggesting that. By the way, uh, I do not get a commission. <laughs> 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 but a hun by hundreds of dollars a month, you're talking about over and above any cost of putting this in. I'm talking about the cost of their power today. For example, if they were a small business and using $1,000 a month of their GMP bill, mm -hmm. uh, we, this system could be producing enough, possibly even to obviate that entire bill, day one. Right. Um, but it's almost guaranteed from the natural resource, and Jeff will get into what that is, from the natural resource perspective, um, looking at this site, and I will say it's mostly gravity, not water, but it's mostly gravity we use in our system. And as far as I know, we're not running out of it. So if this site can harness this amazing amount of hydraulic head, they could easily pay, turn off half of their GMP bill in the first month. Mm -hmm. So that would be a payback to them. And the way you calculate the rate, the kilowatt hour, and that's mm -hmm. kilowatts are great, but what we actually use and what we buy and what your bill has on it is something called a kilowatt hour, which is 1,000 watts for one hour. And, you know, the all-in cost, by the time you have generation and transmission and distribution and all other kinds of adder costs, around here is somewhere in the 17 to 20 cents per kilowatt hour range. I'm paying 19 cents. 19, yeah. yeah. It, it's well, I'm, I'm getting cow power. Okay, right. Well, regardless, some places are more, some places are yeah. less. So in, in this particular site, I think we could be generating power today at less than 10 cents a kilowatt hour. So Does, that includes the cost of the equipment. Oh yes, financing entirely. Okay, In I want to I want to say that because I I know that that's what you're talking about. But I want right, everybody right, right. who's out the there way, in TV land to the way it's calculated <laughs> is very simple. It's the same way as you would for wind or solar or any mm -hmm. renewable. What is the capital cost? What is the operational maintenance cost? Which in our case, microhydro is very very little, uh, and you calculate over a lifespan which mm -hmm. we use the solar model, which is typically 20 years to 25 years, and what the payback in essence would be, mm -hmm. and how many kilowatt hours and the capacity factor, which for microhydro is in the 90s, the 90%. Which means it's better than nuclear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not 1,000 megawatts, <laughs> but okay. it, it runs all the time. In and you've got 1,000. And, and so uh, it, it's highly, um, it, this particular site, we're hoping to announce something with it, with your, we'll, we'll come back here and talk about it. <laughs> and then back to your question as far as the Whetstone Brook. And I think that there is potential in the Whetstone Brook. Uh, I don't know about right in the village, but certainly as you move west to Brattleboro, mm -hmm. and there are a number of first order brooks, by that I mean coming from water sources like springs and other that are feeding into the wet, uh, Whetstone. Uh, which could uh, prove, you know, very, very um, appropriate for microhydro. And again, what microhydro really wants is something called hydraulic head, water mm -hmm. running down hills, because that's how the gravity energy is harnessed in the water to pressurize the water, and that is what produces the power. Mm -hmm. And with that, actually, I'll let Jeff, who is our general manager and really the guy who's out in the field doing the projects and making things happen. I mean, we all do everything. We're a small company. 
Uh, but Jeff, Jeff has forgotten more about microhydro than I'll ever know in my life. He's, <laughs> he's been in Southeast Asia. He's a New Hampshire native. Uh, he was with the Peace Corps and an, an entity of the World Bank in Southeast Asia for uh, several decades, doing many, many, many uh, microhydro systems, but also what they call mini hydro and small hydro and biodigesters and solar and wind and everything renewable. Yeah. And we're very pleased to have... He and I have had some really yeah. good conversations on wood gas. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, but... Jeff knows a lot about that and we're really thrilled to have him coming on board our team. Um, and with that, yeah, Jeff, sure. talk about, Thanks. you know, I've got the box here and okay. whatever, anything you want. Yeah, and I guess what we thought we would do is maybe just sort of walk people through the whole process of, of what is a water, res you know, a water resource, a hydro resource, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it, um, and then kind of the steps that would need to go through mm -hmm. for anyone to take a look at, at, or a community to take a look at a, a resource they have, a stream they have, and then decide whether or not it makes sense now, uh, I, to, I wanna, to do I something. I want to break in here sure, for please just do. a second. Yeah. Now, what's happening here is you're seeing Close the other. water in a stream no, which no. is tiny, yeah. And I'm sorry for all of the all of the interruptions tech, in the yes. video. This is what's called high tech. Yeah. Um, here is a stream. This is running through the woods, yeah. Yeah. and people would would not normally think of this. Is this above the area that the fish would even get into? Yeah, this is is not really a fishery, but it doesn't matter because a fish actually can transit yeah. by that intake unit. If you could draw that back to you, it would make it, it, would make it more likely there that it would go. come into, yeah. into focus in yeah. the camera. Okay. Oh, is that good? Yeah. Well, you well, can see what it's doing yeah. up on the screen. Okay, yeah. I got it. There you yeah, go. Yeah. Yeah. Don't you, quite, I'm that's not, there it is in the screen. I'm not in the stream. There it is. This is the intake in the stream. Right. Yeah. And from that is in fr the, 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 um, uh, th that's what it looks like in nature. So, um, could we, Tom? Could we go to, to the to the camera that's on this? Okay. Click. And what do you want to do? Just put it up so people can see it. They can. It's on. No, it's this here. Oh, oh okay. I'm thing. sorry. I didn't know that's what you okay. meant. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Here. Now. Yes, yeah, so this is the intake. Cleverly yeah. concealing James Perkins. No, I, I don't need to be seen. This is much more important. <laughs> is, the, is, the, is the intake. And that is what we saw in that stream. And James, if you could kind of rotate that a little bit, people can get a picture. There you go. Draw it back toward you so that it's showing well, for the camera. There you go. There you go. Yeah. And basically what happens is the water is flowing over that. Yeah. And if you, if you kind of put your hand down where the water goes, People will see the water flows down that. Now, that area, believe it or not, if a fish came to water flowing the way we saw it in the stream, you can see it again over now. that area, and it said, what do I do now? It wouldn't have to think very hard because it would just put on the, the, uh, the it, would, it would start burning its interior power and it would go right up that. That's not too steep for a fish just to Just so over. you know as well, this concept uh, uh, was developed originally in conjunction with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in the Pacific North <coughs> Northwest um, for salmon smolt fisheries, where they were actually wanting to move fish and they had to ch move water around. And there's various versions of this screen that actually allows the transit without any damage at all to fish. Okay. So that now, was the origin of how it. How big are salmon smolt? That would be very, very nice. small. What, what does that mean? Um, it's like a... Um, a quarter I, I of an inch long? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, right. so, you know, in, my, in the greenhouse at, at where I live, we have fish tanks, mm -hmm. and the fish breed in there. Yep. These are mostly goldfish, but we've had, had other fish breeding, too. And when those, when those little fish are that size, they look kind of like an eyelash with eyeballs on it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> right. They're really, really small. Right. Really, really small. And this thing here will allow those fish to go down over it. I imagine they're and probably... Up. And back up. Yeah, when they're that small, small they yeah. probably aren't going yeah. to. But as they, they, when they want to go up, when they're larger, they can. They can go up, and this thing will will allow that to happen without d damaging those fish. So the fish are basically impervious to what's going on here. This is this is 
non-invasive technology. And, and there's an additional benefit to this particular design of intake. You have, you have this, the screen here, which keeps out the trash and other stuff from getting into the water um, that's taken for the hydro as well, as well as allowing the fish and such to flow over it um, because of the way it's designed and the particular effect it has. But this also has uh, sort of an automatic bypass feature. So once you determine a, in a stream course what the minimum amount of flow that course needs to maintain its health, you know, the mm -hmm. health of the course, this, these units are designed to allow um, from here that minimum amount of water to always flow through first priority to the stream, second priority goes to the hydro. So if water levels drop for some reason, the hydro system will be starved for water before the stream is starved for water. Right. And so right. there's never a case of, of, the str of the hydro power pulling off more water than the stream um, can safely operate at. So and, the and owner has the, ch the opportunity to make that selection. Well, no, this machine may, well, it's, it's designed in, it's automatic, and that's the beauty of this. There's no moving parts, there's no on-off switch. It just happens naturally, and that's why this is a very, very clever design, both in terms of the intake, but also on the minimum bypass. Mm -hmm. and it, it sort of mitigates the concerns people might have that you're going to impact my stream or my neighbor's stream by pulling too much water. Once you're permitted with this, you can't. You have the minimum always available. Now, this, this um, will run in the winter. Oh, yes. Yeah. We'll uh, show you some yeah. photos. What are the minimum temperatures? 35 below zero, there's a, a video of it running. 35 below yeah. zero mm -hmm. is a little colder than yeah. I'm accustomed to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's under the ice <laughs> and the snow. It happens once in a it's while. It's a typical yeah. one. But I wanted to just mention with Tom, uh, your point about you decide the water, the bypass flow. That's actually an area of regulation. Mm -hmm that yeah. we're trying to improve. Um, there was a bill no, introduced into uh, the Vermont House it's by um, yeah, Representative off. Margaret Cheney of Norwich, uh, which it's would this. have helped us quite a bit in determination of that minimum mm -hmm. flow. And unfortunately, right now, um, that's not an easy number for us to attain. Mm -hmm. We're working with ANR, but it is a regulated um, aspect. Show. And it, it needs to be made straightforward mm -hmm. because no, uh, the, the health the of the stream is something that we would consider to be a, a number one priority. Okay, which one is now, there are streams we, that um, do not require, not require permitting. No, that's not true. Not uh, well, they, they don't require the $50,000 permitting. Um, no, that's not related to the stream. That's related to connecting the microhydro system to net meter on the grid. Okay. That would be a FERC proceeding. There are two areas of regulation. One, um, let me put this in front of which camera should I have it here? <laughs> I guess that's good. I'll just yeah. sit behind it. Yeah. Um, the, the, the water course side, which is what we're talking okay. about here, right? And then the grid the side, here. which is the fifty thousand dollar part of it. Okay. And so what we do is we don't yeah, connect to the grid through. because of that. You guys might want to put your hand over your mics while we're chatting. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and you know they they've got a conversation going on Understand. in the background. Understand? Yeah. Um, you're, um, but the, the intermittent streams don't require as much in the way of permitting. Intermittent streams do not support fisheries, and therefore there's no bypass flow issues at all. Uh, we still would size this to be environmentally sustainable. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not going to put in a system that is not highly environmentally sustainable and doesn't damage what is called the macroinvertebrate life and the riverine environment. Mm -hmm. We want the water course to remain in its natural state, supporting whatever the life that's there before the microhydro system was in. And you can come see our systems where they've been installed when we have had permitting difficulties, every single one of them. But every one of them, if you look at the water course, it's very healthy. Now, the permitting di difficulties could be reduced greatly mm -hmm. by this legislation that yes. Margaret Cheney That's correct. introduced. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, that legislation never made it to the, to the House floor. Correct. Um, so you're hoping that that's going to happen in the next in the next um, yeah um, we're, we're, we're certainly hoping um, there's been a lot of support from citizens and some um, support in the legislature uh, both the House and the Senate and I would anticipate that that would be reintroduced for the next mm -hmm. session but we'd certainly like to We'd like to be out talking about it before then. We never would have dreamed that in environmentally progressive Vermont that a low-cost, highly environmentally sustainable technology like microhydro, when a bill would be introduced, that 
Otherwise, progressive legislature, legislators would uh, frankly kill it. Yeah. And it's very disappointing. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, we, we know that, uh, that this is, uh, it's the right thing and it's just going to take time. <laughs> well, yeah, and I think we, what we have to do is keep the conversation going. Absolutely. In this is not the only microhydro technology. No, it's not. There, there are technologies that can be done on very low heads. Mm -hmm. So there are other ways that people could, be, could benefit from that legislation. So it's not just you that the legislation no. would be benefiting. No, and I think that's, that's part of it. The, the, the way the, the, the regulatory world is looked at, it, hydro is that it's all like the Hoover Dam. It's all big and needs very heavy regulation to prevent or the environmental Vernon dam. dam. <laughs> Environment, yeah, or, or whatever. Pick any local dam you don't like. Um, um, but, so to prevent sort of that happening without, without some sort of regulatory control. And unfortunately, the, the larger businesses and, and various other groups um, for reasons, environmental groups and such, always consider hydro to be larger systems in pounding of, of rivers and things like that. And, and microhydro, because it has no natural, powerful business constituent, um, keeps getting pushed aside and ignored for the most part. But it's really unfair to compare microhydro of this scale um, with, with, with the Vernon Dam or any other dam around um, because it's a totally different thing. It needs a different set of rules. And that's really what we're, we're saying is that if you're going to approach this and you're going to make it work, um, because it's a regulatory issue, not a technology issue. It's not a finance issue. That then it needs to be considered in a new light as a as something that yes, it is hydro. Yes, it is making power from water, but it's a different approach at a different scale with completely different impacts. Um, and so we what we have is a product for um, what we call high head. So when you have a very large drop. Um, of the water from a high point to a low point that you can capture in a pipe from our intake down to a turbine. But there are medium head ones and there are low head ones. And sort of the, the trade-off is if you have very high head, you need a little bit of water. If you have low head, you need a larger volume of water. And that's mm -hmm. an easy way for people to look at their resource. <clears throat> um, if you have, you know, a, a, a one, two yard drop, but a really tiny stream, hmm, you might maybe run, you know, your door light. Um, but it's if you over have a distance, it's not a waterfall like Hawaii. It can be over a distance. You can move that so, water over distance, right, but right, ultimately right. you're looking at the drop that you create. Um, so, in that so what system. you're showing us here is is a very small head unit. This is no, actually, it's a high uh, head. This is unit. a high head. This is a high head. Yep. This is the intake for can we something where a pipe show? goes a yeah. long Oh, okay. Ways. So from where you're intaking yeah. to where you're generating the power is a it's good distance Elevation is differential. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. it could yeah. be, we say we'd like to see 150 feet of elevation difference in less than 2,000 feet distance. So 2,000 feet okay. is a long way. Mm -hmm. And the advantage of this, as Jeff pointed out, is that with high head, we use very low flow, very little very water. Low Therefore, water. the environmental impact is de minimis. On low head, the environmental impact can be substantial. And that's one of the challenges in low head is that you need a lot of water. Yes. And <clears throat> that you have to have a lot of water to begin right. with. And there are environmental impacts. And it's more expensive. That's the bottom line. Yeah. It's very viable in many situations. And Jeff is right. The regulatory... Uh, environment could be more supportive for all sorts of small and micro hydro. Right. Our particular type is the most environmentally sustainable. Okay. Now, there, I have a question, which is, you said, uh, did you say 150 feet? 150 feet of drop, of elevation drop. differential right. between a high point and a low point right. on a water course within about 2,000 feet of distance. And how much, if you had that, if you had just those circumstances mm -hmm. that you just described, how much, how much power would you generate and how much water would it use? Sure. It, you could easily run, and we're running, if you go to our website, littlegreenhydro.com, you'll see 400 head of dairy cattle that their heifer operation is entirely powered, the lights and the fans, by the microhydro system. Do you know what the, what the how much power? It's about is? 20 kilowatt hours a day. 20. So this is something that would be not outside the realm of having that amount applied to a house. You could easily run a normal house. It doesn't have to be highly energy efficient. It's not going to run a lot of electric heating and other things, but mm -hmm. you shouldn't be doing that anyway. To put, let me just, I'll, I'll shut up after this. To put it in equivalence, <laughs> that. that system will produce the same kilowatt hours not kilowatts, kilowatt, kilowatt hours, hours 
as a five kilowatt solar array. Which is a big solar array. That's a array. big yeah. solar array. And how much water would that use? Maybe 40, 35 gallons a minute. Okay. And most conventional or low hydro would use thousands of gallons per minute. Yes. Yeah, and I'm thinking in terms of a house pipe. I used to live in, sure. which had a, had okay. a spring that was a couple of Springs thousand, can uh, work, but they have to be away. really big. They, this was a big spring, but it wouldn't have produced that much water. 30 gallons a minute is about a two-inch pipe running full, okay. something like that. Okay, yeah. Maybe, maybe inch and a half. Yeah. And again, it depends on the head behind it. Yeah. Um, just to give you a size of perspective, we're usually using a three to four inch penstock pipe, and okay. we don't want it anywhere near full. Yeah, okay. We can show you All right. this thing in action now. now. Yeah, yeah okay. oh, there's good, yeah. show that. that that's the go pipe. ahead, Jeff. So that's, so that's the penstock pipe from the, the screen we showed earlier. Um, it, it's buried underground to keep it from freezing. It's, it's just, you know, plastic pipe uh, available locally, and it's, uh, you know, that's the size, the volume of water that you bring down the hill. And, and so this is just survive. standard plastic pipe you pick it's, up. It's municipal water, municipal water pumping. Municipal water pumping. And that yeah. is a much, we normally don't do it that deep or big. Let me just tell you that when we do it with farms, most of the farmers have backhoes, yeah. and they go out and use them, and that's what he did. <laughs> They're fun. That's why it was, yeah, exactly, that's why you use them. <laughs> it was a big trench, but normally we'd use a ditch witch because it doesn't have to be buried yeah. very yeah. deep. And, and this is the, the picture is, is the, is the penstock buried. So it's underground and, you know. It's you gone already. It's gone. So you won't have a, issues with that. It won't interrupt your land use or. You or, don't worry about a cow stepping. You don't worry about cows or, or moose. kids going over it with their or bikes moose. or anything like yeah, that. Right. Yeah. Uh, and this is just the power line. Goes back up through a trench to, uh, to the back barn. Back to the barn. Back to the barn where these guy's using it. Yep. Um, and there's and there you the go barn. see the trench and the barn in the background um, to run the power up. So this is pretty far away from the yep. house. About yeah, 900 is, feet. This is beautiful. Look at yeah. this. And this is the actual turbine. So that white pipe we showed out of the, out of the, out of the intake coming down the, the hill comes in here to that big brass valve and then is sent into the turbine, which is a small gray s um, cylinder at the very top of the screen. Now, that valve is designed for a human being of ordinary proportions <laughs> to put his hand around it yep. and turn. Yep. So this will give you an idea of how massive this <laughs> and, the, and the serious impact that results from putting them in. Well, uh, show the picture of the guys putting it in. Yeah. I mean. um, so you can see it's a pretty small thing. And, and it's about it, there three was a picture feet of this by under, less than four. You know, it's in a box. Um, there you go. There's the box. That's it. Um, That's a whole power unit. And, and there's, there's some can, feet. There's you some can see how big it is. Hand, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's and then that, that just goes in and is covered up and, uh, you know, it runs you around. Now, Two. I notice that there's insulation in that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that insulation is one of the reasons why when I heard a recording of one of these things earlier, it sounded like it was about as loud as an electric There's the 35 laser. below zero. Yeah, so yeah. there it is. Um, and that's what you get with one of these somewhere in the woods near your house or near your stream. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're pretty innocuous they're in pretty a lot innocuous. of ways. Uh, and, and there's not much damage that, that can be done to that unless on purpose. So it's, it's a pretty bulletproof, robust system. You know, Not literally talking. bulletproof. No. <laughs> well, <laughs> that one might be. Yeah, Figuratively yeah, 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 bulletproof. Yeah, yeah. Although, so. in the position that it's in, it's not likely to be damaged. Yeah. And then the power is just taken out of there by a cable and run up to the control box. It's pretty straightforward. How and big is the cable? Uh, I'm not it sure depends the on the exact installation, but typically we're using 2 aught aluminum service cable. Two and it's, okay. and it's DC. That's a very expensive cable. And there you go, there's a turbine actually spinning. Yeah. That's great, Jeff. This would be um, what you'd be likely to see coming into your house from the utility. Well, it, what we have is Jeff said a control box, but it's more than that. It's, we have a panel, there's, there's a photo somewhere. Too bad we can't get the sound because there's water here too. Um, we have a panel that mounts next to your service panel. Mm -hmm. And it comes into our electronics, which actually has monitoring software and other things too. And then the power just goes right into your service panel in your circuit breaker, just like it's a generator. You think of it as a renewable energy generator. It's running well, all the time. And there you go. Sorry. I was going to say, I don't have to think of it that way. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is, it's, a, it's a lovely system. Well, there are people that have grid problems and are thinking about generators. And you know, this could be a very cost-effective backup generator or really you could use your grid as the backup and use this all the time and have energy independence economically right. Right. and stability. Right. And you're not generating carbon 
emissions, and no one can take it away from you. Except the bank. <laughs> for a few years. <laughs> and that for would be for years. a completely different reason. Yeah. 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 Isn't that, isn't that fun? Okay, you know, it happens that we're coming right to the end of our program right now. Boy, that was good planning. Yeah, it was. Good job, George. I think you were the one who did it. Okay, um, are we going to continue after this? Well, the main camera that we usually look at, that usually looks at us, isn't working for some reason. Oh, <laughs> That's this camera right here. Right, it I, just I suddenly it, stops working, and I, I can't do anything about it. What we're going to do here. is we're going to say goodbye to those people who are watching on the on the cablecast, and I I will say um, we will have another show next week. But uh, for those who are doing this on a webcast, we may go on. We just haven't made up our minds what well, we're doing yet. We just can't be seen. The Who camera that's actually? looking at us is dead. I can look at you. Fire problem. Uh, Radio. I'm, I'm, I'm look, look here, Tom. Um, you can click on, on the one that has, has uh, James and... Uh, yeah, Jeff I can it. click on those So guys. they can be, they can they can be, be on, on it. Or, and I can be on it. I just can't be on it. Well, do you mind? <laughs> we could just keep talking if James and... and I'll Jeff just say boo-hoo once in a while. Oh, okay. And, uh, All right. Yeah, we or can you do can, that. I can scoot over and you can scoot over to be with me. Yeah, we can... Here, yeah. we can work something out. Here. Uh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we really covered an awful lot of territory mm. really very concisely, I think. Okay, good. Um, yeah. What I'd really love to do is come back and talk about a real project here in Brattleboro. I think that would be wonderful. You know, I the, hope, I, you know, we hope to go meet with these folks today after this, shortly. Yeah. Well, let me know how that goes. You bet. I think, I think we're done for the day then. Unless these people want to talk for a little while. I, I, we could talk for another uh, 25 minutes. It doesn't yeah. matter because okay. they'll just cut it all off and, uh, you know. For the, for the broadcast. Thing. Yeah. The yeah. I was hoping for another hour so we could have a little green hydro. You know, show. running things uh, off hydro in Brattleboro isn't new. No. No. We have a local citizen journalism site called I Brattleboro. Mm -hmm. And they have a feature where uh, the guy that operates the site throws in stuff from the past, you know, historical. Yes. And he put one up about two weeks ago where they talked about the street railroad, the trolley car. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That uh, unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. But this particular winter, they ran it on hydro, and it showed how much money they saved. Mm -hmm. Even downstairs in the police museum, there's a hydro. Mm -hmm. That's it's probably the, the same oh, hydro. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, that's, and that's really our shame right here in New England. That we had so much hydropower already. I mean, you know, some of the first electric generating stations in the nation were, were, built, were built here in New England. I mean, my house in, in Penacook was, was powered off of one of them. Um, you know, and, and they were all hydropower. But when oil and coal came in, it was just so cheap. Um, that well, I just go to the new thing and, and, and it let, it, let it, it flounder. Cheap, and, and unfortunately, uh, we, we've and lost our manufacturing ability to do these things. Um, there's an opportunity there for somebody. Oh, there's a big opportunity. Um, yeah. I knew a guy, met a guy. I didn't really know him, but he he bought a hydro dam oh, yeah. in New Hampshire, mm -hmm. and yeah. he bought it for nothing. Uh, yeah, right. Nothing. Right. And he said he, he could put in three turbines, but he could only afford one. Mm. So he put in the one turbine, and it mm. was enough to support his family. Yeah. Do you recall where this is? Yeah, it's just across the river. Oh, really? Okay. They, but there's stories like that of, of all around people finding old sites and, and, and sort of fixing them up, bringing them back, and yeah. whatever they can afford, putting that in and running it and as they, as they build up. But um, every one you know. of those guys, and I've talked to a lot of them, will tell you oh, yeah. yep. the government regulation for this is you know, off the charts, mm -hmm. and literally they can't afford to move ahead on some of it because of the regulatory the requirements. Paper. And, you know, there is an appropriate place for it, but we're not talking the Vernon Dam on these things. Well, the Vernon Dam... And it could Dam be done and responsibly, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. this needs to be rational. Yeah, mm. yeah. but the, the, the systems that we, were pu that we were putting in when the Vernon Dam was built were systems that did not take environment into yeah, account. Of course, much. of course. And you know, I, I, when I was a, a little kid, I spent years living in Illinois, and I lived on the Fox River, which is just a little ways west of Chicago. And we had a dam in our town, and um, the dam generated a small amount of electricity, but the people in the town took great pride in the fact that it actually had a fish ladder. Mm. Sure. 
And that, I, I hadn't thought about that until recently. But fish ladders in 1955 and that period Pretty new. Yeah, were very unusual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So. They were very unusual. But the hydro opportunities are, are, are very broad, from, from smaller stuff like we're doing micro, um, you know, which, is, which people debate, but up to about 100 kilowatts, and then mini from 100 up to a megawatt. Um, there's just vast opportunities. But again, as James pointed out, and we were told last weekend by uh, one of the state reps from New Hampshire who has a friend who has a hydro 200 kilowatt station, a pile of papers this big to, to get through the regulatory thing. And if you're a small operator, how are you going to deal with that? The cost is beyond the cost of your turbine. So yeah. it just stifles, basically it stifles right. the industry. And what they yeah. have been doing yeah. in, the, in, the, in the political sector has been trying to enable solar. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Because that is something that anybody can Quick and make. easy. It's easy. Yeah. Quick and, and easy. Yeah. You know, there but, are no immediate environmental but impacts. But if they had a, if they had a, uh, if they had a, a way to um, enable micro hydro. Yeah. Now micro hydro goes to a hundred kilowatts. Uh, yeah, that's that's the definition I've always used. Right. A hundred yeah. kilowatts. That's what Wikipedia says, whether you believe that or not. But that's <laughs> de facto. Standard. Wikipedia is a really great resource <laughs> if for things that you can't find. You in, couldn't find it elsewhere. Yeah, elsewhere, right. but. Um, it, which means or you want to make up. Sometimes it's right. Up. <laughs> sometimes it's wrong. Yes. And if you if yeah. you uh, want, yeah. But the the um, a hundred a hundred kilowatts, if you're generating at full power, is a hundred kilowatt hours. It, that's a very large every hour. hour. Yeah. And a hundred kilowatt hours is going to be about in in terms of it's going to range. It's going to be all over the map in terms of wholesale power. But we could figure it being about what. Seven to generate it to, to the amount of money that it would make if you were oh I can't tell you it depends the power purchase agreements can be anything from a penny to negative thirty yeah, yeah exactly yeah. right now you can't all right but if it was say seven how about cents, talking about how yeah. many houses or businesses or town buildings could be provided right with that power a hundred kilowatt micro hydro system could run, uh, I don't know specifically the kilowatt hour usage, but I can tell you, it would run an awful lot of the buildings in the town it would run, of Brattleboro. It would run about 100 houses, wouldn't it? Um, I would think if they were energy efficient houses, yeah. not, okay. not ranch houses with electric heating, electric That's ranges, and electric right. and yeah. this and electric but that, no. This is a respectable Solar houses, amount. you bet. Yeah, 100, 100 kilowatts is a good amount I would, of power. What I was yeah. thinking yep. was if we're, if we're yeah. selling electricity, just selling electricity, <laughs> At seven cents per kilowatt hour, mm -hmm. that would be seven dollars an hour that you're getting 24 hours a day. 24 right. hours a day, yeah. So mm -hmm. this is a respectable amount of money right. that um, it might be good enough for if if the permitting allowed it for a group of people to put together a community mm -hmm. micro hydro system in exactly the same way that the solar farms are being. Sure. There'd be no question that would happen. The the issue really is that in order to get do this all above board. The regulation imposed by FERC and others is so onerous on these small businesses that it's impossible to do, and therefore no one will do it. But if you go to other countries that don't have that, that sort of regulatory burden for micro hydro, it is being done by groups of people. Right. In some places where they have a longer history of it, like, like Nepal, for all its other problems, everybody and their brother are lending money for hydro, micro hydro. You have these community lending groups now fighting over hydro projects because they're such good investments because they don't have that that additional twice the cost for the paperwork that we have imposed here so yeah if you were able to make a level playing field for for net metering of, of solar or or or, or, or mini wind and and, 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 and 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 micro hydro then you would see a, an explosion right. in terms of the well, numbers but also these, these this is where it amazes me the jobs that come from these good jobs in sort of installation and operation good jobs in, in design and construction these are all STEM type things that we should be promoting and doing, but we're not because we've got this FERC regulation that stifles the entire industry. It's a shame, actually. Well, um, you know, one of the things that I'm, I'm kind of gearing up to push for is for every community in Vermont to try to produce its own power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and not 100% of the power. Right, but some uses, percent, but that's great. Some can, percentage. Yeah. And determine on its own or, or in conjunction with the next community over or whatever, mm -hmm. whether it's going to do that and in, in what way. And of course, many communities could get a lot of power out of, out of biomass. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there are many ways to get biomass mm -hmm. power, as you know. I was surprised, you know, if you just take wind power, I can tell you three different ways to get wind power, you know, <laughs> using different turbines. Mm -hmm. And um, they, some, you know, they, you've got 
horizontal axis and vertical axis and airborne now is mm -hmm. starting to starting to form up. I've got a neat picture of airborne. airborne. I, I, I helped week. the group a little bit uh, on their kite system. It's it's, yeah, it's, it's a pretty kite. neat. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's it's expensive power. Um, it's needs the controls need to be automated, but it's a really neat approach. It's a really neat approach. But yeah, the yeah. Uh, Wind power potential way up in yeah, the air is fabulous. enormous yeah, and well, it's that, almost constant. That did did I put in an article this week about that girl in uh, you know, I think it was the University of Delaware who was talking about the the potential of wind power in 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 uh, low level jet streams. Mm -hmm. No, I didn't, didn't put that uh, in. Yeah, bring it. Put I've it in next to, week. I've got to put it in. She she was a, a researcher who figured out that there's a pro, the, the amount of power in low-level jet streams that would be accessible to tethered uh, wind power things that you can identify. She mm. said she started doing the research on this and was amazed to discover that these very constant wind resources are available in over about a, about a quarter of the earth. Mm. And you can put these elevated things up there that might be like blimps, like yeah. the one that you had a picture of. That was a blimp. It the was one, a blimp yeah. that, that had a cylinder in the middle through which the wind would sure. blow. Yeah. The one picture I have, or it's several pictures, and I'll bring them up next yeah. week, uh, it looks like a little airplane. Not a little, it looks like a big, big airplane. One, yeah. 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 And it's, it is, in fact, a, a kite, but it looks, like, it looks like an airplane with four engines. But these okay. things it's are a not kite that with four generators. They're not that high. Them. They're tethered. Yeah, and and they're they're maybe a couple thousand feet up. And this one doesn't show show you how yeah, this, high this, up it is. And there's another approach, in, in, in where they they have a kite um, that's that's tethered to a generator on, on the ground. And what they do is they'll run that kite up and they'll fly it in a figure eight pattern. And what they'll oh do is gosh. they'll they'll pull it down with electricity or a flywheel, and then on the way up, it's generating power. So you have this program where you, you can program it where it's just always up there running this figure eight, being pulled down by a flywheel or excess power, and then generating more power on the up that you then start putting power into a local grid or battery sure, or whatever. Like so you don't have, yeah, but you don't have turbines in the air. You just have a big kite, gigantic kite, and somebody's there with a control stick or automated. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's new. There's a lot of issues um, and flight issues. So, you know, you have this thing up there, you're going to have to change right. flight patterns, things like that. But, yeah, there's a lot out there. Um, there's, there's so many yeah. things going on right now. It's hard it's, to keep up with. really crazy. But that's all technology development. Hydro is there. We're here. Yeah. And it's old. It's economically you know, we're, we're viable. stumbling over old dams yeah. because we can't refurbish them. Well, it goes, what, what back three, three, four thousand yeah, years? Yeah, more than there's that, nothing yeah. we have to <laughs> invent. Yeah, yeah. It's I, all I mean, there. In the Himalayas, there's, they say they were building water grist mills 10,000 years ago. 10,000 years seen, ago. And I've been up in sites that, that are thousands of years old. The site, not the building. The thing uh, that really no. surprised me was um, mm. tidal power. The first tidal power sites mm. were done in Ireland during the Middle Ages. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's like yeah. all yeah. of this technology that we talk yeah. about today as though it was I the latest thing. I got some pictures thing. of that too. Mm -hmm. it's, Have you? That's oh. incredible. Yeah, not not 600 years ago, but, <laughs> but so some of the tidal power sites. Some of the tidal power sites. Okay. Are we no. done? I don't know. I was just going to say, are we on yeah. or done or what? I, I believe we're being recorded. Whether this is actually we're being yeah. recorded, so we this can do what we want to do. This is going to go on the cable cast okay. thing, okay. which will be the the, okay. the back end of the same show. It, okay. it will be edited. But, yeah, can can we see a? Uh, can you sometimes send us a link or something to that or whatever? Oh, I don't sure. know yeah, how to absolutely. Get to, yeah, to see absolutely. That. I watched the last one. It okay, because yeah. the you know I'd like to be able to in, in something like that when we have the main camera. Um, and when we have the technology that we can put on a laptop to show lots of things like uh, you know, project plans and mm -hmm. you know, details. I think that would be excellent. Yeah. Like here's a it real would, site. You know, when you, what we want to if do. you, if you can do. get a local mm -hmm. plan going right. with, a, with a local organization, yeah. that would be really a stunning Yeah, that's what I'd love to do. So thing. It would be fun. Anybody out there uh, we talked to, actually last week there was a large, there was the New Hampshire Local Energy Solutions, um, solutions um, annual meeting, and I know it's not an annual meeting, it's like a, a trade show, but there was probably, what, 500 people at least? Good, good number, a lot yeah. of town energy committees. There was actually a great group from Brattleboro High School that was there and had a yes. booth near us. Yes. Isn't that interesting? And Their new movie. It's cool. A little yeah. movie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. you know, so we put the bug in their ear that, you know, hey, we want to do something in Brattleboro and mm -hmm. let's let's figure out how to... Do they were they were great guys, yeah. Mike, yeah. I think was his name. The teacher. Yeah. The, yeah, the teacher, teacher, yes. Yeah. Yeah. He's and been then he had a couple on, of students that were wonderful. Yeah, he was been he's been working on a 
on a project called Project Atlantic, and I'm not sure if that was that's the, what they showcased. They were okay. Yep. Yeah. That was, and believe it or not, I take less Credit pride in this than I might, <laughs> but that was that was the result of a proposition that I brought up before nice. the t before the town meeting two years ago. Uh -huh. And I just said I think we should have a subcommittee, the en Energy Committee, mm. told to do this. And so they formed an energy subcommittee, and there it went. Uh -huh. And uh, they've been investigating, basically yep. investigating what's going on in Europe was what they were told to do. Mm -hmm. But um, it's become a, something which I think the kids in the high school have, th there's a lot of information there. Mm -hmm. And I think the number of people who are that age, you know, if you think about global warming and things like mm -hmm. that, these kids mm -hmm. have got their lives invested in what mm -hmm. we do about global warming. Well, if they're and looking at Europe, they're going to find lots of small and micro hydro. Uh, there's a, a headline every day that crosses my inbox about some new small hydro and micro hydro product mm -hmm. project, especially in Scotland, England, Ireland, mm -hmm. um, Scandinavian countries, mm -hmm. uh, but certainly also Central and Southern Europe. And they are way more. Um, I, I don't know what the number is today, but I know that mm, 10 years ago, uh, it was almost 20% of EU power was from hydro of all kinds. Mm -hmm. And most of their hydro is small hydro. Mm. And our power was about 7% hydro, and 90% of ours is, you know, Hoover Dam hydro. Yeah. And that's what we <coughs> learned to do very well is low cost, industrial scale, you know, dam the torpedoes, and we're going to do it. Yeah. But the impacts... Um, you know, uh, in 1915, they didn't think about those things. Well, in so. 1915, they had an entirely different economic system. Of course. They, yeah. had a, they had a country that was, by the standards we've got today, really underpopulated. Mm -hmm. Nobody, aside from Teddy uh, Roosevelt, cared about the environment. Right. And right. It, was, it, was, uh, it, was, it was just an entirely different thing. Yeah, mindset was different. Yeah. Mindset was different. When I was a kid, I remember looking out over the, over the, the town of... Northfield, Massachusetts, from where and and Bernardston, from from where I lived, which is on a mountaintop, and seeing smoke coming up from a concrete plant, mm -hmm. and saying, "I wish that wasn't in our view." And my aunt Ruth saying, "George, that's that's the this you know that's so the it keeps the buildings that's the, 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 the town progress, progress right? yeah. economic you know, the smell of progress yeah. is right. what yeah. they used yeah. to talk yeah. about smell yeah. of progress right. and and paper mills too paper mills too <laughs> yeah if your if your <laughs> water wasn't yeah. polluted yeah. then you weren't Something running your you. economy yeah. right <laughs> you know well it's been yeah. a lot of fun being with you guys mm -hmm. and i uh, hope sometime in the not too too distant future we'll let we'll us do know. Something. I think until we find a good project, we yeah. can sort of document it nice and, and crisp and, and show that to people, to show that it can, there's a lot of opportunities. Well, you know, you know if, get people thinking, if you are doing something in, in Brattleboro, yep. BCTV, which is running this, mm -hmm. would allow us to take cameras into the field. Oh, that'd, that'd be cool. And we could well, just do it, and we could oh, actually, yes. yeah, we yeah. could make a TV show out of it and have a... Well, have you could make a whole show out of it. Out of a yeah, cool. documentary and... Get the kids involved. Yeah. <laughs> they did some nice films. Yeah. Yeah. His yeah, they know what they're doing. No, yeah. I saw it. It looked professional. Yeah. And well, again, thank you all, you all the people who have watched to the end of this one. And we hope to be able to get you a, another show in Micro Hydro, which is going to be more fun yet. So, there you go.